Well, it's a lot of distance <laughs> to cover here <laughs> our territory. I was going to say. <laughs> but I operate, I mean, really, energy. I operate from the premise that everything is about energy. Everything. And, and I spent a, li a lifetime, or it seems like a lifetime, but I spent a long time active. Political activist, and then I walked away from that because I just it didn't make sense to me anymore. I uh, I became when I look at politics. When I looked at when I when I had the identity of a political activist, because that was the first idea. Once I was on my own, that's the first identity I took was political activist, and I spent ten years doing that. And then when that came to an end for me. You know, I had, when I had to, I had to examine the reality of all that, and I realized, well, this, as a native person, this doesn't really work. Because I, when I had that identity of a political activist, everything about energy. So when I had that identity of a political activist, I was putting all my energy in identifying as a political activist. When that became my identity, then that means I, I could only see as a political activist. You know, I forgot I, who I was. <laughs> yeah, I'm a human being, and, and I think that that it's important that we all remember that's who we are. That's who we are. We are human beings. Political activism may be something that I do, or <laughs> a plumber may be something that I do. But I'm, you know, I'm not. I'm none of these things. I'm a human being, but I confuse the things that I do for my identity as to who I was, and I was blind because I could only see in this very narrow perspective. I mean, it's just a different version of being a, a, a tea partier. Right? It's just here. This is how you see it. And the other thing I learned from that experience for me was when, when I looked at the, for what we were doing as political activists, it was like, hold it. We're trying to get our liberation, so to speak, or our freedom through political activism, but they're not our politics. So we're using somebody else's definition and rules all the way down the line. So no matter what we do, we're, they got us. Because it's not our politics. And, in the, and, and what I mean by not our politics, it's like every political organization I've ever been involved in, but I walked away a long time ago, so I can't speak for now. But every political organization I was ever involved in, number one, they develop an ego, they become mm -hmm. territorial, mm -hmm. and they're competitive. They're not cooperative. Mm -hmm. Politics is not cooperative, it's competitive. I, I, I saw too many times of unity, and all, in the end, to me, all that unity meant was, it's still in the end, those are the most aggressive, we're going to get their way, <laughs> right? That was unity. That's the unity I experienced. I, I don't know what goes on now, right? But the unity I experienced was, in the end, it was just, in the end, you know, and... Uh, and so when I look back at those things, I saw how all, all our energy was being put into things. And our energy was being put into either illusion or or, dis, or unbalanced. Keep things that were ideology that was keeping us unbalanced. As a movement, as individuals, you know, it was keeping us unbalanced. And, and, and if we're in a system that's designed, it's designed, everything's about energy. We're in a system that is designed to absorb and consume energy. That's what the system is designed to do. All right? Whether whether we're we're plugging in our iPhone to I charge it, or we're buying gas for our car, all right, or we're buying GMO food, everything is designed to consume energy. And and energy. See, I I think that energy, the source of our energy, is the being part of human. And that's why I think to me it's important. That no matter what level, whoever we're working with, it, it's getting trying to re reawaken this memory of being a human being. That, that's our primary identity. Race and gender, all the rest of that are secondary identities. We're human beings first, and then the gender, and then the race. All of the rest of this mm -hmm. becomes, and then there's a gender and race are secondary identities, and then you get these other uh, sub identities uh, that go on to it. Uh, our politics or our religions or our whatever, then these, all these little <laughs> sub identities. So it's almost like we're human beings, and then the human, and, the, and, the, the, and with these sub identities, the emphasis is being put on the human part rather than on the being part, the source of the energy. 
How many times have you said or heard people say, I'm only human? <laughs> I'm only human, then I'm not recognizing who I am, I'm not recognizing my potential. You know, I'm, I'm not... <laughs> it, 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 my perceptions, all right? Uh, I think, and like energy, and we're in a system that's designed to consume energy. So to me, it's like, well, hold it. Then it, if we want to get anywhere, then we have to find a way to be able to use our energy so the system can't consume it. Mm-hmm. To the, the same way that it consumes it now. It's like um, a way of, and for us as an, individually, for us as individuals, the being part of human, that's the energy source, the being part. Because when we got no more being, <laughs> when we go back to the earth, that's just, you know, that, that's, we call it death or whatever one, somebody wants to call it. But when the being is gone, then the human can't function. So obviously the energy source for us in the human being is in the being. And the human is the, the wiring, <laughs> so to speak, right? That carries the electric, the electric of the being. <coughs> so the being. So as humans, how we manifest the power of being is through our intelligence. This is, this is the converter. This is what takes the being part, the energy of the being, all right, and our intelligence. So how we perceive reality says how how we will use our intelligence to manifest the energy of our being. So if we're not perceiving reality as human beings, we're, and we're perceiving it from, from the, the sub-identity, the secondary identity by race or gender, right? then we're not accessing the energy. See, so, and, 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 we're not, and if we're not using the energy properly, if we don't understand who we are, and we don't, we don't recognize and understand who we are, then we're not going to use the energy properly, all right, then, then in a way we've been imprinted by society to misuse energy. Am I still, am I being sad? So, all right, so to me it becomes an issue, and, and I don't, and I, and, I, and I don't think it's about a revolutionary solution. I think it's about an evolutionary solution, all right? Evolution, it's like, I saw this woman in this sign, but she took revolution and she separated the R all right, moved it away, and it says our evolution. See, and that's yeah. what it's about. Our evolution. We're in a le- we're, we are in an evolutionary reality. That's that we're a part of an evolutionary reality. That's the we're a part of a, a revolutionary reality, but that's the sub reality. Mm-hmm. We revolve around the sun or whatever all that's about. But but that's a part. That's a sub part of the the main part, which is evolution. Am I making mm-hmm. all right mm-hmm. evolution? All right, so. So we're, we're, we are connected to an evolutionary reality. We generate our power and en- our energy through how we perceive reality through our intelligence. And I think that no matter what situation, if we're dealing with incarcerate, it doesn't matter who we're dealing with. I think we need to start thinking in terms of the basic ident- the basic thing of recognizing who we are, human beings. That our power comes from the being part. We manifest that power through how we perceive reality. Because too many times we've been imprinted to believe that money will get us that money will get us power. Alright? That a, or that weapons will give us power. Alright? Or that religion will give us power. But in reality, the, the, these things if you get money, that may give you access to authority. Alright? If, if you use weapons, that gives you access to authority. Religion can maybe give you access to authority, but authority isn't power. Authority actually, in a lot of ways, is the absence of power. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they need to have authority because they don't really have power. Mm-hmm. I mean, because when you go back to indigenous, the tribal and dis- indigenous systems, there were not authoritarian images or figures. There, all right? I mean, there was authority, but it was in a different way. It was the way that the people lived. So it was, it was, it was a consciousness. It wasn't an, an imposed. You had the police coming and beating you up, stuff. Kind of, and I think so. It, part of it has to do with us recognizing who we are for, on the energy, because I think that we've used. In my in my experience, we were using. We were trying to find political solutions. We were going, or economic solutions, or whatever the solutions were that we were trying to find. 
but we weren't approaching it from purely from the point of energy. How do we use our energy to get a solution that we want? Right? And, and we, we never really approached it that way. And I think for now in our generation, as to who we are in our generation, I look back at this and I think that one of the most helpful things that our generation can do is go to the next generation and say, hey, look, this is where we fucked up. See, I don't see enough of that. I don't see. I don't see enough of it. I see what I see going on is, hey, we did this. This is how we did it. We stood up for all this and that. But you know, but when we really look at it pragmatically and objectively, what we stood up for, all right, it was the other side just buying time. <laughs> so they threw us some crumbs so they could buy time. And their their authoritarian authoritarian state is more vicious and more well entrenched now than it was. All right, when we were going, yeah. I mean, this is the reality of it, mm -hmm. you know. So we did all of that stuff. Like I watched this um, Occupy movement, mm -hmm. right? and and I saw people from our generation coming out and, and rah rawing them on, saying, "Yeah, right, you know, I'm glad to see it." And I think, well, hold it, this this is like an ego trip, mm -hmm. you know. We're we're not willing to talk about mistakes realistically. We're just so we're going to encourage the next generation. To make the same mistakes that we made, all right. Maybe the terminology changes and things, and the technology, but basically the energy, because they're they're putting their energy in the same way we did it, all right. And so that didn't really work. You know. Uh, so part, all right. So part of it is so as human beings, we're in a energy. As human beings, we're in a technologic industrial perceptional reality and it's a mining reality it mines energy right it mines the energy of the trees it mines the energy of the earth it mines energy the water the uranium the oil it mines energy now remember we are units of energy every human the being part is the unit is the energy unit <laughs> so we are units of energy we live in a perceptional reality they mine our, our bone, flesh, and blood, our DNA is made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth. We are shapes of the earth. We have being, our being comes from our relationship to the sun, sky, universe, where the energy comes from. That's all right. That's our, we have that. All things of the earth, a tree, uranium, fossil fuel, whatever it is, it is made up of the same DNA as us. All right. And it has the same relationship to sun, sky, universe, so it has being. It gets its energy from there. All right. See, so that's what all my relations is about. Now, now, we're aware that they mine the uranium, they mine the fossils, they mine all of that for energy. But in order for there to be a need for those other things, they have to mine us. See, we don't understand, we don't think in terms, they're mining the being part of human, all right? And then, they're mining the being part of human, all right, to, to distort our perce all right, And when you mine... All the rest of the things, whether it's the trees, whether you, you mine, you mine the, the oil, you mine the uranium, the mining process leaves behind poison and toxic that are dangerous to the environment. When they mine the being part of human, it leaves behind poison and toxic, and the poison and toxic are the fears and the doubts and the insecurities. All right, they become a part of our human perception mm -hmm. because we no longer recognize that we're, that we're human beings. So they become a part of the human perception. They're not a part of the being human perception. They're a part of the human perception. So that mining process takes place by how we're indoctrinated to perceive reality through the class system, through the educational systems, through all the authoritarian systems. All right, that's how they do the mining. But it leaves behind the poison and toxic in our consciousness, which the fears, doubts, and insecurities. And then once that once that's put in there, then we perceive reality not not through our abilities. We perceive reality from the perception of our inabilities. Am I good enough? Through our fears, our doubts, and our insecurities. And then we find and then but in order the way the system works, but in order to compensate for that, they introduce us to pride. So that they indoctrinate us, as they mind us, they, re they indoctrinate us that to replace humility with pride. All right? They indoctrinate us to, 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 to replace a sense of well-being with fear and doubt of self. Now, in our generation's self-esteem, I don't remember ever hearing the word, but by the next generation, <laughs> low self-esteem, you know, I mean, that's the big... All right? And so anyway, to use that terminology... We, we're, we're imprinted to perceive reality that there's something wrong with us. So now, so whatever. So after that, once that takes place, what? No matter how good our intentions are, whatever we get involved in, all right, we're putting. That's a part of the energy we're projecting that there's something wrong with us. 
You know, and we may hide it with our mask and our angers and our fears and stuff. But in the end, that seems to be the core. That seems to be fear, <laughs> all right? Seems to be the core motivator. So that's what distorts our perception of reality. We're in a, de- we're in a system designed to consume energy. All right, so how do we find... To me, it becomes a matter of how do we find a way to not feed our energy to it. We're, we're in a system that has imprinted us that this civil disobedience... Protest. All right. These are the ways. All right. To get to get your rights. All right. But hold it. If these were really the ways to get our rights, then they wouldn't have told us about it. <laughs> all right. I'm telling you. I guarantee you because these fuckers are like that. All right. They wouldn't have told us this if it would really get us there. All right. Now let's go back and, and terminology. I think we should be very careful with the word believe. All right. And think, believe, because all of the mining process, imprinting, to get us to perceive reality differently, as, all right, everything they did to us, they did it to get us to believe, to believe their perception of reality. For, uh, it was genocide, you know, it's all, class systems, everything, all right, is to get us to believe. And yet, you know, so I, I want to kind of explore that word a bit, and so to believe. Everything's about energy. When we think, we project electromagnetic energy. That thought is electromagnetic energy, electromagnetic energy being put out into the universe. All right. So we're projecting energy all of the time. We constantly we're projecting energy. Now, thinking represents energy that flows. It's going to go do in an evolutionary context. Believing represents energy that has been that has been put in it has been dammed up. It can't flow anymore because all belief, all right, has its biases, its prejudice. It's not objective, all right. See, so now, so we have been imprinted, all right. Number one, to have low self-esteem, there's something wrong with us, all right. And then, and we've been imprinted to believe that we didn't think it up. And no matter inside of our own, your own self, every negative image you have, you didn't think it up. I guarantee we didn't think it up. Somebody put it there repeatedly until we believed it. And then it became a part of our perceptional reality. So every time that, so we're conditioned to believe, all right. And so what believing does is it takes that energy, the energy of thinking, the electromagnetic energy of thinking that's supposed to flow, and it dams it up and puts it in a container. But it's energy; it has to do something. It can't just be <laughs> right. It's energy. So what does it do? It intensifies. Behind the belief and the basic core belief in every ind- almost every individual is that there's something wrong with me. I'm not good enough. So this this damned up energy is going to come out <laughs> through that. It's going through the stress, all right, which creates and produces emotional reactionaries, emotional reactions, and in emotional reactions we're not going to think clearly. Have you ever had an emotional meltdown? <laughs> all right, and then go back and say I wish. I have a question regarding that. So. When you're talking about belief in that sense, are we also including like a, our belief system, like when we're raised up with that belief values? Well, see, this is what I mean. If I'm saying we have to be careful with the word because <coughs> because I don't know if we had belief systems. Quite frankly, they told us we did. I think we had systems of knowledge. We knew this. We knew these things. I mean, I think that more of it was knowledge than it was belief. We knew that if we lived this way, all right, this was going to be what was going to happen. And then they come along later and say it was a belief. Okay. All right. I mean, I think this. I, I mean, this is all speculation on my mind. I mean, you know. the other thing I was just thinking while you're, while you're talking about that is that damned up energy. I'm thinking of its link to how it becomes commodified. Because what do you do with the energy? I mean, how are they living off of it would be my next question. So they've got to live off that damned up energy, so they've got to sell you whatever it is to keep it damned up or to keep it channeled in whatever direction it is, right? Yeah, no, th- this is why we overconsume. consume mm-hmm. All right, because we're trying to fill a hole inside of us. So that's, I mean, see, it's... Just, it's, it's we need something. Yeah, right, I mean, see, like, right. like in, this, in this country... Up in uh, the late early 1900s, once they'd figured out mass production, all right. Once they'd figured out mass production, at that time, 
the average American, they would go, when they went to the store, they would get what they needed. And that was it. So, so but now, hold on, we got mass, mass, we can make Model T's a thousand a day or whatever it is, right? But we can do all this and that. So, but here's how the Americans are doing. So they brought in Freud's nephew. And oh, yeah. Freud's nephew did this big, did this big analysis and came up with this big program on how to indoctrinate the, to manipulate the mass psychology so that they would go and buy what they wanted. But first they had to create the want. See, and the technology was emerging with the radio, with the newspaper, all right, and the tech, and, and promotion and advertising and the new products coming out. See, when, once they were making it in abundance. So they started the manipulation of the mass psychology, all right, to turn people into consuming what they wanted way beyond what they needed. All right, and so, yes. So, so because as, as a net result of this, when we're, we have, we're very confused. I mean, our intentions are good. See, energy, our intentions are good. Our motives are good, generally. Well, anyway, I, here's what I think. You know, if you ever, if there was a bad result, and someone said, well, that wasn't my intention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, well then, all right. Well, then, what I think, I think there's a synchronicity. I think there's motive and intention and understanding and then action. And I think when those four things are synchronized, then you're not going to have a bad result. But too many times, I know people that have good intentions, but their motives I would question. Mm-hmm. All right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, <laughs> or, or, or you can reverse it, right? <laughs> you know, but, but too many times. So I think it's a certain... But see, all of this comes back to our ability to think. See, when we think things out, and we start to see these kinds of things. See, because, because I think, for, especially like to young people, to me, it, it, like uh, like around the issue of drugs. If it was me, I would tell them, all right, yet yeah, about how dangerous drugs are, but I would not include marijuana because they know that's a lie. It's a lie. A marijuana. I mean, it, just from this end, marijuana is not a drug. The Earth does not grow drugs. This is just a logical, physical reality. The Earth does not grow drugs. Somebody makes drugs out of what the Earth grows. See, and, and you know, it's such a ba- to me, it's a basic, it's it's a basic reality, all right. And maybe intuitively, <laughs> right? Something, but but so I, I think it's about so it's about, you know, it's 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 a, it's a herb, it's a plant, it's a medicine, and I and I think speaking to them, you know, about you, especially with around the cultural thing, it's a medicine. So you use it as a medicine, all right. But if but if you take any medicine and you misuse it, it's not going to work for you. That's right. Right, but but if we go around telling them that marijuana is a drug, all right, and they realize, you know, hold it, they see a, they see a whole different trip on it. Then this, they're going to get into the drug stuff. This is what leads them in. All right, I don't think that marijuana is a gateway drug. I think the misperception about marijuana that we pass on to them is the gateway. You know, and and, and I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying if we're going to talk with them, right, and I think helping them, helping young people to understand. That they are human beings, and the value, how much power they have. Mm-hmm. All right. I mean, if we're, if we're going to talk about power, and because most youth, young people are that they feel powerless, that's why a lot of this to deal with situations. But if we want to talk about power, and this, I don't think this is just for young people. I think this is for all of us. Is that have you ever had a situation where you're feeling powerless about life, <laughs> whatever it is, and while you're feeling powerless, how bad can you make yourself feel? And then how does that affect the people you're closest to or you interact with? That's power. All right? That's power. But it's power unrecognized. All right? And how is that power manifested? Through a negative self-image or, or, or things, things that we were told that weren't correct, that we believe. All right? But, it, my, but my point being is it represents intelligence used incoherently and chaotically. All right, and we generate that, and we generate energy. So imagine if we if we took took the responsibility to use our intelligence with clarity and coherency, we would generate an entirely different kind of energy. Because remember, we project electromagnetic energy. All right. So, and, and it's like we're trying to create a solution to a problem. And this is why I think that a lot of the active movements, the movements, 
they they did what they did, but we didn't really achieve what we were after. But one of the reasons I think that that happened was because number one, we we were we emotionally reacted to what we believed. We didn't think things out. All right, I think that had a lot to do with it, as to why we didn't get uh, our objectives met. All right, and what was the other thing? But so how we use the energy of our thinking, the electromagnetic energy. Yeah, all right. So if if I'm projecting, if in my core of me that there's something not right with me, all right, then no matter what, no matter what I do, I'm going to bring some of that back because it's electromagnetic. I'm going to attract the magnetic aspect of it if I think there's something not right with me. If we have a, if we have a problem, and, and for any problem, because everything's about energy, the energy we take to put in to creating the solution for that problem, that energy is going to be in that the solution. So if what we're doing is if we're going to create a solution for the problem, but we're but we but we have lo- this term low self-esteem, so to speak. All right, if our fears are masked by our prides and our other stuff, we'll see. But if all that stuff's in there, then that stuff's going to go into the solution. So if we're making emotional reactionary, using our energy in an emotionally reactive way, all right. Because we, out of desperation to create a solution, no matter what solution there is, that energy is going to be in it. Mm. That's how they get. That's how they've been doing this all this time. Because we we have been imprinted to be emotionally reactive. We've been, been imprinted to be judgmental. So to be careful with the believe thing. All right. Because every time you say I, we say I believe, that means we're not thinking. Yeah. We're, just, we're just shutting it off. All right, and that's reality. But but that energy's got to go somewhere, right? So it'll come out in some other kind of a way. All right. And the other thing is judgment. We should. I think it's our responsibility to think and not to believe. I think it's our responsibility to recognize and not to judge. Because if we judge, we again we can't recognize because all judgments have their biases and their limitations. But if we recognize, then we can see what really happened. If we recognize, see, we'll make it personal about judgment. Somebody told us a lot of stuff when we were young. All right, to give us, to make us, to give us this low self-esteem thing, so to speak. All right, somebody put all that in us when we were young and we believed it. All right, and then we've judged ourselves because of those those negative beliefs. We've judged ourselves. All right, but if we rec- if we took the time to look back and recognize how it happened, then we would see we didn't ask for it. Not a one of us ever asked, <laughs> all right, to be judged or traumatized with judgment when we were young. Not a one of us asked for the trauma, all right, that made us start believing the negatives. Mm-hmm. But see, if we would go back and rec- look at it from recognizing, then we start to become more clear and coherent in our thinking, all right? Because I think that for me, so. When, when I'm saying this thing about it's designed to ent- for the, we're in a system designed to absorb energy, then part of it will I think well we need to start thinking in terms of how do we deny it that energy. Like I, I mean I'm going to just go the most basic way is to think and not believe, to truly be humble and not prideful, because see they put all that in us see because a pride you know because pride I spent. A lot of years as an activist, Indian and proud, or whatever that was all about. And if I could go back and un- undo that little one, I would, right? Because I've seen pride get in the way. <laughs> I've seen it get in the way more than I've seen it help. Yeah. If you want, I mean, when things, real things, need to be done. If it's all superficial stuff, yeah, well, then all right, it's all good, rah rah. But when you get right down to the stuff needing to be done, it's pride gets in the way almost every time. You know, and they started indoctrinating us with that as native people. When they started slaughtering us, they were well, the noble red man. They, they they were proud and they fought valiantly. No, <laughs> it wasn't what it was. All right, they were trying to kill us, and we fought. All right, we fought to save our lives. Pride didn't have anything to do with it. it didn't have anything to do with it. It was the humility of us knowing who we are as the children of Earth and what our responsibility to the Earth was. That's what really made us tick as to who we were. But now I hear the word humility used a lot. But I, but I see pride practiced. I mean, pretty much, you know. And 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 and, we, and it, it's it's like looking at the. And for us, it's about looking at these things 
you know, let's look at reality the best that we can, right? And sort out what makes sense to us. But to, but to just do things the way that we did it, to encourage the next generation to do things just exactly the way we did it in our generation, I think is, yeah, I think it's just, I think it's wrong, <laughs> it's ethically wrong. And we're going to get down to it. And if we're going to be real to who we are, all right. I, the other thing I think is, is that if we're going to look at, if we're going to look at, let's say, spiritual realities. All right, because I know we all have our own interpretation and understanding of a spiritual connection. I do not understand how we can truly show spiritual respect to anything, however you look at the Creator. I do not understand how we can true sh- show true spiritual respect if we don't like ourselves. Mm-hmm. Plain and simply put. All right? yep. Because remember, <laughs> energy that you put into a solution that, that you, is going to be in the solution. All right? See, so. And so we're quite out of we're just out of synchronization, right? I, I don't understand. And then how we're going to show respect to our Creator, the spirituality of our Creator, if we don't use intelligent our intelligence respectfully. But that goes again about liking ourselves and respecting ourselves, right? And and so you, so there's certain things that I really that I think really need to be kind of looked at. I like a lot of a lot of, and a lot of native or younger people. They, you know, because they're so overwhelmed by stuff going on, you know, uh, we forgot what tradition is. Mm-hmm. See, and we think we lost our tradition. They took our traditions away. But no, tradition is honor and respect. That is traditionalism. All right? That is what traditionalism is. They can attack our ceremonies. They can attack all of our stuff. But that doesn't take away our tradition per se. Am I this making... Right? Sense. You know, I mean, you see, so... But see, it's because there's a lot of illusion and mind <laughs> mind bending has been going on in how we've been imprinted. But to me, so because I really don't have a real answer how we address to solving the problem with the, I mean specifically with the young. But I do think that if we talk to them just straight up, right, just straight up, that we would talk to anybody else. We talk to them straight up. And help them to understand about who they are and their relationship to power, you know, the real power that they have. I think that you know, I think asking, you know, whatever it is, and they don't have to tell us, they don't have to spill their guts to us. But think about whatever it is that first set the trauma in your head. What is it the first time somebody told you you were no good? First time somebody said whatever, it, but said those kinds of things to you. You know, think about it. You know, yeah, that's something somebody said until you believed it. It isn't. That doesn't mean it's true. You know, and I think. <clears throat> I think in those kinds of ways that it was because my, my 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 whole technique or thing about it is and it doesn't matter about age is I just say as many things as I can that make sense to me and then it may and if I throw enough things out there I know somebody will think about something <laughs> all right I, mean, I just I, I use that shotgun approach here to say it all as much as you can all right and then whatever makes sense because different what, different things make sense to different individuals my objective is to stimulate thinking it's to stimulate thinking because that's what I see is the about energy all right that is the ultimate thing that I see that's going to help us to change anything because see we've been imprinted to fight them and we're never going to outfight them it's not going to happen it's not going to happen in our lifetime it's not going to happen in our great grandchildren's lifetime it's never going to happen we're never ever going to outfight them but they want us to believe that we have a chance right, of fighting them, you know. Right? But in reality, is what, what the one, what do they fear? If they fear anything, it's our ability to think. See, we can outthink them. Mm-hmm. See, but they don't want us to understand that because that changes the numbers. See, because you live under an, in an authoritarian system. All right, in the authoritarian system, X amount only X amount have permission to think. Mm-hmm. See, only X amount of them have permission to think. Then everybody else got to follow the chain of command. All right. But so, and you look at the authority in America right now, just hypothetics. But like, there are close to 300 million people in this country. Even if they're using 100 million of them to suppress the, the other 200 million, they were still the majority. Now, if that majority was thinking clear with clarity and coherency, all right, then the dynamic would change. I mean, this, this is an extreme thing, but. 
if everyone woke up tomorrow morning and said, I will not enable anything I know to be a lie, the energy dynamic would change immediately. The system couldn't, you couldn't function. I mean, I mean, it is an extreme hypothetical, right? <laughs> but the reality is, I will no longer enable the lie. And I think that it's important for us to adopt that as a mindset for ourselves. You know, because, you know, and, and, and when I mean no longer enable the lie, here's a lie that we shouldn't enable, that there's something wrong with us, that we're not good enough. See, we shouldn't, we're enabling those lies. You know, so, you know, you know and, and, and I think that on an individual basis, so, so to me, they don't make prideful decisions. You know what I mean? Make clear and coherent decisions about whatever it is. And, you know, and it's hard to, it's hard to not have an emotional reaction sometimes, you know. I mean, it's really hard. So I'm not saying don't have an emotional reaction. I'm just saying don't make an emotional decision. If everyone woke up tomorrow morning and said, I will not enable anything I know to be a lie, the energy dynamic would change immediately. The system couldn't, you couldn't function. I mean, I mean, it is an extreme hypothetical, right? <laughs> but the reality is, I will no longer enable the lie. And I think that it's important for us to adopt that as a mindset for ourselves. You know, because, you know, and, and, and when I mean no longer enable the lie, here's a lie that we shouldn't enable, that there's something wrong with us, that we're not good enough. See, we shouldn't, we're enabling those lies. You know, so, you know, you know and, and, and I think that on an individual basis, so, so to me, they don't make prideful decisions. You know what I mean? Make clear and coherent decisions about whatever it is. And, you know, and it's hard, to, it's hard to not have an emotional reaction sometimes, you know. I mean, it's really hard. So I'm not saying don't have an emotional reaction. I'm just saying don't make an emotional decision. Sometimes maybe we've got to have the reaction and get it out of our system so we can make a clear decision. But too many times, and for the movements, see, that we were all a part of, they all operate on emotional decisions. You know, so, so the beast says over here, well, I'm going to invade Syria. So everybody gets an emotional reaction. And then over here, well, we, here's Fukushima. Everybody, right? And uh, all these emotional decisions, see, and there's no focal, focused energy. The energy is, it, it, it's something about an internal combustion engine, and, you know, the chaos, it, it, <laughs> when it makes chaos, makes the engine run. All right? Well, the chaos of our intelligence is what makes this other engine run. I got a question because uh, you're so right. Um, a lot of the kids uh, that were part of uh, Think Outside the Bomb uh, went and trained in a place that we have for children. It's called uh, the Teilula Learning and Healing Center it's for children. And young kids come there from, you know, all walks of life and all cultures. And. Um, one of the things is, is that uh, some of the young people uh, came back and and because this is what we talked about, right? What we did was show the masses of the young people and the energy that the young people had and what they were uh, capable of doing. On the other hand, the system itself set back and I would use the, ter the things you're saying, is mine the energy. <clears throat> so the energy that the young people took there, with all good intentions, at the end of that, were totally exhausted and confused about the next steps. Not to say that some people weren't and didn't know where they were going, but the majority of them didn't know. Yeah. And uh, Which is really sad, right? And so all of this thing about passing it on to the young people. Give it to the young people. And I always say, why are you going to give it to the young people? They don't deserve it. You know, have you clarified what it is that you're talking about? What have we, have we become clear and clean with all the things that have happened in the movement that we can then say, we don't want you to take this junk, but now take who you are and, and, and move with what you know. So I think that in terms of the other example I would use is the clear example of what happened with the immigrant movement in this country. When we had thousands upon thousands 
of people marching around the country, right? And once again, uh, this country sat back and they allowed it to happen. Watching the amount of energy that could be put forth in terms of, of these mass movements and then uh, sitting back and letting people uh, again wear themselves out because of how do we move in that direction uh, to find a solution that uh, they already have. Yeah. It, you know, and so that it, it uh, comes to a point in, in reality for me as you're talking it, that um, we have to find that source of energy and how uh, we learn uh, to understand it because more than uh, more than utilizing it right is to understand it because as we sit here right um, the energy that we all feel and the connectedness that we all feel um, is uh, is the things which lack right? with a lot of our young people because most of our young people are just gun ho to do whatever it has to be done in the spirit of the revolution <laughs> but nobody's sitting back and thinking as they um, what we need to encourage. So we need to encourage. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Is you got, you know, it's like a, a, as an example is about what we have to understand between. Because I look at a lot of, I look at what Alcatraz. When I look at the things that I was involved in. They can't do that today. That can't be done today. You know, and and it's like, like like as an example. This Occupy Wall Street. Yeah, it was a trap. You know, they can identify everybody that has a cell phone that was at a Occupy Wall Street, and their cell phone didn't have, doesn't even have to be on. They can identify everybody that was at any Occupy Wall Street if they had a cell phone. Now, what does that mean? That means while well, they got their phone number, that means well they know who you call up, all right, and then they know who they call up. <laughs> it was, it was. It was, it was something sinister lurking way back here in the shadows. All right, mm -hmm. seriously, because they, they're not identifying people just for the fun of it. They got they have a, there's a reason they're doing this that we will truly understand better. But everybody was emo. What I mean by emotional decisions. But everybody emotionally got caught up and ran out and jumped into what was basically a middle class white man's deal. All right, but in reality, all right, and they're using idle no more for the same thing. To identify people, all right, and 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 uh, and, and but that whole thing was bait. And I, I think that the Occupy Wall Street, I, I think that the moneyed people, they organized it, all right. So for purposes and reasons of identification, all right, and because they gave them everything, they can they can identify down, right. I mean, if they have the phone number and they have the name, then they got your picture. Because you have a license or you have some kind of ID somewhere, then they know who you are. They know where your money. They know everything. All right, and and, and I think that and and they followed the money that was contributed to it. See, so <clears throat> so when we're talking to young people now or anybody, <clears throat> I'm not saying not to protest. I'm not going to say right. you know because I understand some body stuff has to be involved in it, but uh, but think it out. <laughs> you know, I have a clear strategic <clears throat> objective. Because what I was saying, like in terms of non-cooperation, but nobody wanted to hear this from me about because <laughs> everybody was all gung ho on Wall Street or uh, Occupy. Nobody really wanted to hear it. But if all of the time, because what did Oc the Occupy Wall Street achieve? Yeah. You know, I mean, other than somebody released some steam, <laughs> emotional steam, but what did it achieve? The one percent control of the country. <laughs> yeah, they help. that's right. And now they know who the main who the main ones are that resist it too. I mean, when, when you look at but if they, but looking in terms of energy, if all of the time and money and effort that had been put in to organizing Occupy Wall Street, if all of the energy, if all of that counted up as energy, was put into 
organizing people not to spend any money on the same day. All right, trying to organize 30% of the population not to spend any money on the same day. All right, then there would have been an objective. All right, that would have made a statement that they couldn't, they could not, they could not <laughs> ignore, and it would have made a statement without handing everybody's identities over to them. <clears throat> you know, we have these kind of discussions with the youth, and even the youth come up and, and they talk about this picture. Yeah. You know, about this is the reality. This is the reality of what society is doing and can do. Mm -hmm. You know, but many adults don't believe that, or we deny it. We deny that this system has evolved to this level, that their technology, and it's not just about sending somebody to the moon. It took a lot of technology to do that. And in the process, they develop other things and other connections that they even sold back as commercial products. You know, New York set up the cameras, right? They set up the cameras where now they can watch every street and they can do facial profiling and all this. They, they, they had a company that when they hear a gunshot go off, you know, they went in partnership. This company went in partnership with New York to develop this system. You know, so, you know, when we look at that and how they evolved, we have to look also how we evolved. And, and what denied us from our own evolvement. And also how we denied ourselves. And how we deny ourselves today. You know, this reality, you know, how, how, what, how do we participate in it? And, and I go back to, you know, we talk about energy. You know, we, we, you know, we look at the children. How do we interfere with their development? really young. They're coming up. What do we teach them? What do we tell them? What do we feed them? Not only the food, but the thoughts and ideas. Their environment that we create. You know, the consumerism that we hear, yeah, it, it has evolved. We have a, we live in a consumer society. Youth are worth 10, 15 billion dollars before they hit 13. Because they have the power to influence their parents to buy. As parents, you know, if we really look at the history of this country, you know, are we in denial with the reality? Because if we are, we can't come up with a solution. To the, the, the way that society is now, and we look at the unemployment, like look at Watsonville, 25, 30% unemployment. Who's unemployed? What do they look like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? <clears throat> And where do those jobs you know, go? Yeah. Where, and where do jobs go? Where are they? You know, so where this are. this is a reality in, in in the movement, you know, we were young. You know, we looked at all kinds of ideas. Whether it was from China, whether it was Marx, whether it was Engels, whether it was Chairman Mao, whether it was Malcolm X, whoever. Because we were a people that were trying to survive and trying to understand what our reality was. And at the same time as we were coming up with our solutions right community we have community organizations you know we have people that work that money came into organizations and organizations develop breakfast programs develop schools develop free medical clinics that came out in san francisco out of san francisco general hospital you know the workers our families were there and then doctors and everybody got together we had to work together but also we had these things like the eagle are not knowing how to develop relations, so maybe we weren't together as we should be. But in San Francisco, in Chinatown, you had Iwakun. In Japantown, you had J-Town Collective. In Petrel Hill, you had the Young Patriots, who were white. You had, uh, in the Mission, you had La Raza Organizations, or those kids. You know, in Fillmore, you had the Panthers. It, everybody was doing something. You had a Native American movie. You had uh, Valencia. You had all these things, and people were trying to do what? Express our humanness. Yeah. Survive. And, and part of what interfered with that movement was this system that didn't want this to happen. They mm -hmm. want us to get together and talk, and they definitely don't want us to get together and act. So they interfered with it. Took leaders, took them out. In jail, but also we didn't take ownership of the things we were doing to ourselves. Drugs, they were there. Alcohol was there. You know, uh, eagles were there. You know, uh, personal interest was there. You know, um, we, we we also as 
people I think today that have come from that. You know, even today I look at you know in unions. Okay, we had union elections recently for business agents, and even within there they're fighting because they have different opinions of how to do things. But what is the commonality they have? They're supposed to be there working for workers' rights, trying to develop a better, you know, uh, life for their families. Well, we have gangs. We have North and South. But we got a lot in common, right? And even in the same family. You know, we're brothers and sisters, but you're North and I'm a South. You know? So what, what is the ownership of, of, of saying, taking ownership and saying, man, I'm doing something wrong. You know, I'm doing something wrong. When I come home, put down, you know, we're going to drink. If the kids come, let them drink because at least they're home. What do we do? And in this circle, we have to ask ourselves too, what do we do in our habits that take that energy? Because we talked about energy way back, right? And either you're dispersing it, right? Because we're using it. How are you using it? Efficiently? We think about our cars and we say, hey man, I want my car to be efficient. How can I, you know, balance my tires, my engine, you know, air cleaners and all that. But what about us in our life? We use a lot of energy and time in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. you know, and it brought us here today. This is how we, why we are who we are today. We're part of that. I'm part of that. You know, I, I, I came out of that. I'm here today and I'm still involved in the movement. Looking at saying, hey, how do we promote life? How do we become more efficient? Mm -hmm. How do we push aside the BS and not participate in it? Yeah. And to me, that's the goal not to participate in it, not to get caught up in being defined. You know? I mean, I didn't think anything was wrong with me growing up. But I heard that, you know, if you're a person of color, then you, you're nothing. Tracking system? I didn't develop the tracking system. I got, I was part of it, you know, but I didn't say I wanted to be in it. That's right. Well, John, um, we are, uh, as humans, um, able to think if we let ourselves. How would you say that, that if we as humans would need to stand up to the industrial military complex on a human level? I mean, it's in our hearts so that it just doesn't keep continuing. How, do, how does that well, well, first, transfer? First, I, I think we should, whatever we're going to participate, whatever we're going to do, we should do it on the human being level. Okay. We, <laughs> the human being, because if we're going to do it on the human level, we're ignoring the energy part of us, the being part. Okay. So I think, I think human beings should be, that's who we are, right? And, and, and no matter what we do, military, industrial, comp Whatever we do as human beings, we need to do it with clear, coherent thinking. See, that's what it needs. That's the core of what is needed, is for us to think with clarity and coherency. Because that, because that, that, is, a way, that is a way of seeing. See, we have an ability to see, all right, beyond our eyes. And, and, with clarity, it's almost like, like with seeing and feeling. Clear, coherent use of our intelligence is a way of seeing, a way of feeling. All right, and I think that that's necessary to anything that we do. All right, if we're going to stand up to the military-industrial complex, number one, we need to take responsibility for our intelligence and use it clearly and coherently. We need to take responsibility for our intelligence and use it clearly and coherently before we do anything. Otherwise, none of the rest of it is just going through motions. To take, you know, and, and, it, and, and I want, because we've been imprinted with this abstraction of freedom, you know, and because I'm, I mean, it's a nice rah-rah, the word freedom, <laughs> but, but it, it, it's a lie. All right? It's a trick and it's a lie. Freedom. Look at the word. Dumb. It ends in dumb. All right? Free and dumb. Free and dumb. Free, dumb. All right? But let's look at the dumb. D-O-M. It's, take, it's taken from the Latin for dominion and domination. So they take free and then they add domination to the end of it. 
All right, that's a, the dominated free. So what kind? What's that mean? No, and then logical, just logical, practical reality. If someone mentioned about not being in denial and self-denial. Then let's let's all right, let's cut right to the chase. We're born into a, re a reality where you have to pay to be born, you have to pay to die, and you've got to have money to live. Now, where is the free? I mean, this basic, simple reality. Where is the free? All right? I mean, simple reality. Now, but now let's go with the other way. I understand the, uh, the reality of being free. Being free. All right? Now, that, uh, that makes sense to me. All right? But for human beings to be free, they need to take responsibility. Responsibility is an interesting word. It's two words. Response and ability. Response and ability. All right? And, and responsibility. Then you put them together. All right? And that's what... So, as a human being, all right, we need to take responsibility. And how do we take responsibility? By respecting and using our intelligence as clearly and coherently as we can. Think things out. Don't make emotional decisions. I'm telling you because we've been so... Because the whole deal about being imprinted to have all these self-doubts and... I mean, those ones that maybe everybody doesn't get to see, but those, I'm not, am I good enough? All those hidden, I'm good enough. With all that imprinted in there, right, then... then that mean, what, with all that imprinting in us, all right, we have a responsibility to deal with that. But the responsibi responsibility, the, as two words, the responsibility is to use our intelligence clearly and coherently and look at that, look at that that is not the truth, that there's something wrong with us. See, our responsibility in using our intelligence and with clarity and coherency. And I think that when we do that, what we will see, because, I, because it is part of an evolutionary there is only an evolutionary solution. There is no revolutionary solution. But if we take responsibility to, t to make... The, we, and it's about a decision we make. And it really is to use our intelligence with clarity and coherency. Then we will generate clear and coherent energy. And just how we affect people with <laughs> the, 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 the poor me energies, the beating ourselves up <laughs> energies, we would affect with clear and coherent energy. That's a responsibility. All right, and because there is no instant solution, people get caught up in this the, the romanticism of revolution. But I'm going to tell you, revolution means you go back to where you came from. All right, that's all revolution means. You go back to where you started from. So if you started out oppressed, you're going to end up back with oppressed. That's revolution. That's just the reality of it. That's what I mean. See, but evolution is another context. Now, if people uh -huh. understood to use revolution, all right, as, to, as a point to get somewhere in an evolutionary context, that may be different. But people look at revolution as solving the problem. And it doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. Right? And no revolutionary... I mean, there's romanticism about certain revolutions and stuff, but in the end, no revolution has, will ever succeed because every revolution, no matter who wins it, they end up dealing with the industrial ruling class. See? So yeah. are the real... Is that, is that there's an industrial ruling class on this planet. That's who the real, <laughs> the real threat is against us. All right, and Capitalists and Catholics and uh, uh, Jews or Muslims or whatever, all, the, all of that, communists, all that, they're just smokescreen stuff. Those, all right? Because they, the, the, that industrial ruling class controls all of that. So if we're going to stand up for anything, if we're going to stand up for anything, then let's stand up for ourselves. All right? And what I mean by stand up for ourselves, stand up for ourselves and take responsibility to use our intelligence as clearly and coherently as we possibly can as often as we can you know and 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 along the way we do that and it and, and because because what i find interesting about it is that it becomes easier to do once we start to do it you know it, i mean and, and it is it's a decision we make you know everybody here does something they have a job or there's something they like to do or but what everybody here has something that they do and and whatever that something that they do is somewhere they made a decision they were going to learn how to do it and then they focus the energy of their intelligence on learning how to do it. All right. See, so it's something we do all the time. But this time, it's 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 invisible. It's it's a different kind of. Ma it's a magic. It's not a material magic that you see instantly. It's more of a different kind of evolutionary magic. Make the decision. I'm going to see use my intelligence as clearly, coherently as I can, and and then do what is necessary to do that. And then this is what starts to open up abilities to see, in a whole new dimension. Because the because the real the real deal is to me is we need 
in my own personal opinion, all right, is that we need to start thinking. We need to think our way out of this. All right, all the rest of it is secondary. We need to think our way out of this. And when we do it on an individual basis, individually, all right, we will see change in our life individually. <laughs> it's because it'll be about how we perceive. But see, everybody wants to skip that step. See, but it can't. You can't skip it because we've all been infected with the disease. So now we now <laughs> we have to become our own antibiotic, because it's a, it's a and I call it an infection. It's like there's this disease that affects the perception of whoever has the disease. It, it, it affects the self perception, which then affects the perception of reality. All right, and we've all been affected by. It. But 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 the gift, if we're going to look at spiritual contact, the gift of intelligence that we were given as human beings. See, the gift of intelligence is the one thing that can undo that. It's a decision we make. All right. The decision, clarity and coherency. I'm going to think more and believe less, and I'm going to. I'm not going to judge at all. I'm going to recognize and not judge. You know, and there are fine lines. You know, and people are going to say, you know, but but we but we'll know the difference. <laughs> we'll know because when you recognize, you're seeing it for what it is. When you judge, then you're feeling some kind of moral superiority. Basically, that's the best I can break it down to. All right. And sometimes we're going to look at, we're going to recognize the thing for it is, and people are going to try to play word games. No, you're judging. But no, that's not necessarily true. See, that's what I mean. So this way we stay authentic to ourselves. Uh-huh, authentic. We should never lie to ourselves. We should never, because we, we need to, it's up to us to authenticate. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, <laughs> all right, that all right, that word, right? <laughs> it's up to us to do it for ourselves. Yeah, authenticate ourselves. It's up to us to do that, right? And that's good, because that's part of our gift, the gift of life. It's up to us to do that, and we do that by seeing who we are and understanding who we are, and then how we do our acts. So, yeah, that's right. Recognize we have the gift yeah, to see, think clearly, and and and. and 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 we all have that gift, all right? and 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 the deal is because once we start to do that, then there's going to be people that don't get it and don't understand. But the thing is, fine, they don't understand. But I'm not going to argue. You know, I mean, if somebody disagrees with me and they don't want to go with me, well, I'm not asking them to go anyway. But but if somebody disagrees with me, right? Then I got no quarrel with that. All right, no, fine. If you don't if you don't like it and don't get it, uh, fine. All right, and and that to me, because because what I found is that it's almost like we talk about what we all have in common and common grounds how we go against ourselves and all I mean because that happens I've, I've seen it happen so many times but the thing that I think that's inherent in all of us all right is a thing called common sense all right but nobody's really making sense <laughs> right now because everybody's fear and reactionary motivated for whatever the cause I mean I mean really so I mean to a large degree all right, and what we gotta do to these young people, to anybody else, is we gotta be as clear and coherent as we can and make sense. <laughs> yeah. Make sense, right? And as I was saying, don't tell them marijuana is a drug because that doesn't make sense, right. you know? Because they know, and they don't trust us, and I don't blame them for not trusting us. I mean, you know, if you really get down to it, I don't mean on an, ind- but just kind of as a generational thing, because <coughs> because we went out and gave it, a, we gave it the best shot that we could, based upon our abilities to perceive reality all right and obviously it had some pluses for it but it really wasn't you know it really didn't solve the problem because when I was growing up where I grew up on the reservation well the alcohol and unemployment see but now it's meth and crack right you know you know what I mean and it's much more destructive than it ever was for my generation it's a much more it's much more a much more brutal reality now you know, and so we did all of the good stuff that we could. We did the best that we could, but the deal is, there's an even more brutal reality than the real. What I see the reality coming for our our, our young ones, the, the descendants, right? Is the reality the brut? I see the brutality. I see brutality in that reality that's going to be equivalent to the brutality in our great grandparents' reality, as Indians. All right. I mean, I'll say it like that. I mean, for us. See, but but I don't mean this. But what I see for the future, white kids are Indians. Everybody's it's, it's a class Indian now, right? And but th- that kind of a thing. So this is why I think it's important for us. I know it's not fast enough for anybody's clock, but the deal is, we need to think. <laughs> we need to think our way through it. Because an example, of that, see the efforts like this. What you're doing here, this is a great thing. Even if I don't know what the numbers are participating in, see, but it's here. It makes sense, and it will. 
think in terms of evolution, right? It will draw more because the, because the energy says that it will, all right? Because there are people that are out there. And, and to me, it's kind of like, well, we do what we can, make as much sense as we can, right? Because that's what I see as our common denominator, to make as much sense as we can. Yeah, let me share with you. Um, we have a center that we run, and, and the children come there. They start out probably when they're five years old and they've been coming for years now. And um, and most of our uh, work is based on energy. And we teach the, the kids, we don't impose things on them, but we try to uh, take who they are and build from the strength of, of where they're coming from, uh, as we say, as human beings, right? So that that allows them uh, to feel more freely about who they are and, um, and be uh, more cooperative in, in the area, in, in the camp. So I see what you're saying and I think it, it's uh, very important and uh, kind of made it more uh, crystallized, the, the process that we're doing back home more important. Um, because many of these children are now adults. They're not children anymore. But they started out when they were five years old and six years old in the process. So um, it, uh, and, and I think one of the most important things is, is what you're saying is think. Um, reacting out of emotions because you react is something that you're taught. And and, um, and I think it's really important to recognize that because you know we talk about different levels of emotion and uh, what emotions really mean to us. Uh, so I think that in that process is what allows um, the kids to go deeper, right? In terms of, of feeling who they are. And as we say, you know, it, it is to create, um, you know, ourselves as, and, and acknowledge ourselves as human beings. Because we say we will give you the, the greatest honor, right? We will treat you as a human being. And so that the, when they come there, that that is all that is required of you. Nothing else is um, you know, they, they learn, um, and, and it's, uh, and I think it's so important that I'm here at this discussion with you uh, today. Um, and as I was telling Mary Lou and them, um, in our beliefs, uh, nothing is a coincidence. And so, I just wanted to thank you uh, well, for having the opportunity of being here today. And well, no, I'm, I'm, I appreciate that. And, and I do want people to understand, I'm not trying to disrespect whatever our efforts were in the past. Right. Right, because we did what we did with, from what we knew. But we're at the age now where we really have to look at it, you know, look back and say, hold it, this didn't really... See, I don't see enough of that going on because some of my own... Some of the partners I ran with, you know, they didn't learn shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> Still trying to pretend it was 1973, you know, and hold it. it but I'm sorry, it ain't, you know. I mean, and not only that, we have an obligation to teach the youth to not make the mistakes we made. But we have to tell them what the mistakes were right. we've in a way to, that makes sense. We've got to, we've got to admit mistakes. Yeah. Well, that's where we often see one of the one and of the things to us. Yeah. One of the things Teresa, I you know, listen to her stories a lot, and so I always want to add something she may not have thought of, including, I think she, maybe when I was in the bathroom, were you talking about the Occupy kids being at the camp? I did mention that. Yeah, so I mean, a, two and a half years ago maybe, the Occupy kids came to do this training camp to get ready to go to New York. But, but so they were, you know, they rented the camp and Starhawk did some permaculture with them. And, you know, there were some interesting things going on. But the most interesting point on this evolutionary process that you're discussing and how would you get people 
to not go to the event? I mean, what if they threw an event and nobody came? You know, I've been thinking about this since the Battle of Seattle. And then I was thinking about it with the, uh, was it the Republican convention in Minnesota or something? Yeah, yeah. They spent, you know, zillions of dollars on police fusion technology and everybody, you know, all the young people went up there so we can get into a big fight. And I mean, I understand that because I grew up in the Bay Area in the 1960s and thank God for Alcatraz, by the way. Because uh, it really did make a difference in our high school, at least to raise our consciousness. But, um, and we started dressing in, you know, Indian headbands and growing our hair long, wearing flak jackets and combat boots and trying to be in solidarity with you guys while you were on the <laughs> island at Woodside High School. Um, but, <laughs> just so you know, uh, we were there. It was us. But, what was interesting about the Occupy thing is some of the young people that came to the camp and to this land-based outfit, after this whole thing was over and they're all exhausted, some of them came back because they needed to get back to a place to relax again, try to get that, you know, maybe it is the green, you know, and the air and the water and all that. It is. And come back and really what this one guy wanted to do, they call him Bluebird because he used to sit the tree at Berkeley before they arrested him for trying to stop him from cutting the tree down. All he wanted to do was get back and work with the plants and he didn't want to kill any bugs, he just wanted to move the bugs from that plant. And he, he relocated the bugs, he didn't kill them. But that, you know, so it's guys like that who one or two, three, four at a time. Some of them stayed afterwards for a year and embedded in the community. God forbid somebody thought of that. They'd go do a protest at Los Alamos and everybody left except for three or four of them that said, well, you know what, let's stay in Chimayo. You know, let's stay in Española and let's work with the people in the community because nobody ever talked to the Chicano rank and file in the community about what the hell's going on in Los Alamos or something like mm. that, right? So, I mean, it is that slow, God forbid, that slow evolutionary thing has uh, just about done me in a few times. I get so impatient that it's so slow and I'm emotionally reactive and God damn it, you know, but you got to trench it out day after day. Yeah, I mean, it's evolution, you know, and I do, and I think right now just with the way everything is going, I think, I'll, I'll call this a camp, or just for lack of a better terminology, right. but I think camps like this are some of the most sensible things that are being done. They're not getting all the glory and all the stuff, see, but, but I'm telling you in the long run, all right, right. because they're land-based and people are, and the people involved in these things, and, and camps like this are keeping a connection to the land, and I think and I think keeping a connection to who they really are themselves, you know, and because I, I think in a whole lot of ways, we all have the, the self-doubts and all that stuff that was put in us and stuff like that, but I think that people that are working in these kinds have this communication with reality, have a, have a better opportunity to sort out what needs to be sorted out, because, because this, is a nat this is natural to who we really are, you know. All this stuff is. My answer always comes back to think clearly and coherent. Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of people, that, that's a frustrating answer because it's not enough of an answer, but, but it's the answer that has been, to me, it's the answer we avoided listening to for the last 40 years that I was active. You know, because we all had our own agenda, you know, and I was, you know, our idealisms and all this and that, you know, because what we're up against in an evolutionary context to understand what's going on now, politically and economically, and with the whole police state apparatus that's evolving and stuff, or that has evolved. In the 60s, the baby boom generation got a lot of attention historically, because the baby boom generation showed up and we were the majority, and, and we showed up and we were for all the right things, civil rights and feminism and or women's rights and the earth and no war and for all of the stuff we were for all of the stuff right and we were the majority but when that industrial ruling class 
when they figured out what ignited us, all right, what kicked us loose. And what kicked us loose was that America at that time had the most affluent, our generation came into the most affluent generation that had ever probably existed in human history. All right? But because of the technology, materialism, see, and it was that abundance of it. And what it did was it made the, our generation more fair-minded. See, so t more of our generation, well, why can't the blacks <laughs> have some equality? Why can't we do, no, you know, a war, see? But it was because of economics. It was because of the affluency that the young generation had. See, so that, so then, now once they figured that out, they started the first redistribution, massive redistribution of the wealth, and it was called an energy crisis, and it came in 1973, and they lined people up for blocks and miles to get gas, and they made them buy gas every other day. I mean, the price of gas went up from 25 cents to 60 cents. The price of bread went up, the price of everything went up. And then they had another one a few years later in the 70s, and then in the 80s they had the savings and loan deregulation, and at the end of the 80s, that had been plundered for billions of dollars, right? Put, which puts the society generally further and further in debt, and see, in every decade they've had a new one, because they knew we were the majority, and that we, they, but they knew we were the majority, but they needed us to be the labor force, all right, and to carry the lie for the next 40 years, all right, so they had an economic redistribution of the wealth, because they knew we would have families, we would become more economically independent, uh, more economically dependent, See, so that manipulation has been going on all of this time, and what we're seeing going on now is just an extension of what started out then. Mm -hmm. right? And practical realities, the police state that it's evolving now, and, and they use Clinton to sell it here because Reagan, Bush couldn't, the NAFTA thing, all right? and the GATT, the General, Trade, the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, which created the World Trade Organization. And, and back when I saw these things in the 90s, and I saw, hold it, this is what the, this is what the GATT agreement means. This is what the World Trade Organization is, right? Then, and the GATT agreement just basically means everybody that, that's a part of the, the General Agreement on Trades and Tariffs, all right, everybody's a part of that. They agree that, that the World Trade Organization the, will be the final decision maker on any, economic, on any economic differences that come from the member nations. Which, mean, which in effect means that whatever sovereignty America is supposed to have has now, has now become subservient all right, to this. I mean, this applied mm -hmm. to all countries that went in. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and it, it meant, uh, it meant as, a, as a rough example, it means that if some company in America couldn't make, or some huge corporation in America couldn't really make as much profits because of the environmental laws, so to speak, mm -hmm. as some country in, in in Bulgaria, they could make, because they didn't have the same environmental thing, then it, this dispute goes to the World Trade Organization. Three members are the decision makers that are appointed by the corporate state, right? And then whatever their decision is, then that decision is final. So their decision can be, all right, that we have to lower the environmental standards here. All right, see, I mean, this is on paper. I'm not saying it's happening now, but it's, see, and I'm like, well, how the hell are they going to get away with this? See, but then, so they started passing little repressive laws since 1990, and then in 2001, with 9-11, then they got to put the whole package, anybody from our generation, if you remember, they tried to pass Senate Bill 1 after Nixon had been tossed out of office, and the, the Patriot Act is Senate Bill 1, but it's a whole high-tech one, all right? <laughs> see, and, see, See, so, so the deal was they, they made the agreement in the 90s, and then they were setting up their bureaucracy. They spent all this time setting up their bureaucracy, and in, and in setting up their bureaucracy, they also needed to, to put their enforcement aspects in place. They needed to develop their enforcement aspects. Well, they've got their enforcement aspects in place now. Did you see the Boston bombing and how... The, you know, this wasn't police. This was a military operation looking for these guys, right? You see, huh? see yeah, and, and yeah, no, see, and, and they showed it out public, and in, and there were there's been m many versions of it. There was one in San Francisco. Some guy, some shooting on the freeway, up they closed down a neighborhood on an exit out there near somewhere near Marin. All right, I mean, see, so so now we see what their capabilities are. The, so this is why I'm saying that it's important that we think, right? Because it's a much more dangerous beast than it was before. You know, because because in my own personal opinion, you know, in my own personal opinion, there's an industrial ruling class, communism, Nazism, socialism. All of these were experiments to see a capitalism. All of these were experiments to see which would serve the industrial ruling class's need the best. All right, and then you know, so Russia had gulags. 
right? But now they got FEMA camps. They just haven't filled them up yet. Mm -hmm. You know, they had that whole thing going on in Central America during with the Contras and all of that when that was going on. They learned how, and that was a training ground how to how to deal with mass populations and stuff. You know, all right. And, but they activate the National Guard. See, here maybe they will not activate the National Guard or they'll create something else and call it. But see, all of this stuff going on. So this is why it's important for whatever it is we're going to get, our young people are going to get involved in. It's, I think it's important for them to, number one, have a sense of their own self-worth, that they're human beings and know that there's nothing wrong with them, right? right? And to think. See, and, and I think it's important as a part of the sense of self-worth you know, to understand it, not to confuse doing something wrong and thinking something's wrong with you or believing something's wrong with you. Because a lot of times, because we were imprinted to believe that there's something wrong with us. It's like getting traumatized. You get tra and I call it a form of trauma. But however the trauma comes, is you get the traumatized, the victim of trauma, what do they do? They, re they react out certain characteristics of the victimization and the trauma. Some kind of way they react it out, all right. And every time they react it out, it makes them feel, blame themselves even more that there's something even more wrong with them, right? And, and this is what I'm saying. It's important to recognize <laughs> what happened, all right. To recognize it, then you can learn from it, and see from it, right? Because because that, what has happened is, we've all been traumatized, and then as it's like throwing a stone in a pond, the ripple effect. We've all been traumatized, so it affects our perception and our behavior, our reaction. So we do things now that we judge ourselves for. All right? And that's how this whole thing, that's why it happens like that, does. So that way we'll always be judging ourselves and never really seeing ourselves. And that's what, so well, I'm getting it. So that's why it's like, so doing, so sometimes it's important to understand that we, that it's okay, that there's nothing wrong with us because we did wrong things. Because... 99% of the time, the wrong things were a reaction to something, all right? That, and I'm not saying that to, this to justify continuing to do wrong things, but I'm saying if we understood that, it would help us to see ourselves, and I think especially for younger people, all right? Because I think it's very important, because, because it's, I think it's crucial that young people have it explained to them in some kind of way so that they start to think about that there isn't something wrong with them. Because so I think idea, that's the core the of everyone. Of them doing what they're doing because they're supposed to do it based on how they live, what's been presented to them, how they're being educated, how their environment is. Or the you lack know? of. They're, 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 they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Lack of it. But we want them to think. We want to inspire them to mm. question. We want to inspire them to look it up for yourself. Don't believe me. But I'm trying to give you my experience, my history, my thoughts, ideas, and hopefully it will give you an opportunity to use the resources you got, your technology. You know, and if they don't have technology, we help them get technology. You know, you know, googling computers, all that. Look this stuff up. You know, and and then let's have a discussion. And I, I like that. Not judge them. You know, no, we, we don't judge them. It opens the door. We're not respecting our Creator when we start judging. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, 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 that's that basic to me. You know, no, that's not, you know, we weren't put here to be judges. No, we were put here to see. <laughs> we are put here to recognize. I was asked by a teacher to come to a class and talk about marijuana. And the first thing the student asked me, is it bad for me? And I said, no. She almost fell off the chair. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not. If you need it. A person that has glaucoma and they need to get release the pressure in their eyes, they smoke marijuana. Somebody that had AIDS, they kept throwing up food. It helps you to put it down. You know, so if it's bringing balance to you, it's increasing your life, and that's it, hey. But in this society, you've got to recognize that there's laws against it. UCSC, they have Marijuana Day, right? Yeah. Thousands of people go up there. A young man that we work with, he goes down, lots of them walk down the street, and bam, he gets picked up, and he's up in juvenile home. Yep. The same day that they had thousands of people that were just, hey, go for it. So, again, this is our reality. We have to deal with the reality. Yeah. 
Okay, maybe it's not good, maybe it's not uh, good for you or not bad for you. Do you need it? Or at this time, you're on probation. <laughs> you know? Mm. You know? So, you know, yeah, we, we have a, you know, uh, for me, you know, I, I look and I, I hear your stories and stuff, and I, and, this, and I hear, you know, kind of the circling. Um, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We are. You know, because this has been given to us. Okay, but again, we have some consciousness. We have history. How do we use that in order to be more mindful of what we do every day? And also to combat that which we know is not right. The injustices, the inequalities in the society and the things that keep being and going on and keep being perpetuated. You know, how do we change that? I like the idea in our community, you know, I, I say, you know, uh, sometimes we may say, well, where are you spending your money? Do you really got to go there and put that money in McDonald's? Right. Yeah, you know. And we're always saying that we ain't got much. Why? What else can we do? So sometimes we have a cooking class. Mm -hmm. And I know when they eat, especially in the morning, they have a whole different attitude. That's right. In Bogota, Colombia, not so long ago, <laughs> maybe, what, three or four years ago? They had a general strike where nobody drove cars for a whole day in Bogota. Do you remember that? I mean, that's the yeah, kind yep. of thing you're talking about that would make more impact if you could think it out and get people to do it. That's right, because because it's like, because I, I came with this thing about not spending any money on one day, right? And it's, right. But it's because that's a, that's a form of that. Right. Because it, because when you look at it, everything everything's about energy, but it's also about money. <laughs> right? And if, and protesting, I mean, and I'm not trying to discourage, because I know you got to put body politic into it sometime. But to just protest, the way, number one, you buy magic markers <laughs> to make your signs, <laughs> right? <laughs> you, right? You buy your bottles of water and you buy your snack food and you take, right? You get all your stuff, your little outfit. To go. So, you, so you're spending money. You spend huge amounts of money get spent to get to the proof, you know, be beating that, the oppressor economy. Then the cops get to come in and beat you up, <laughs> right? They get to practice their little tactical games and stuff, you know, and they'll, they'll always send someone in to justify them being able to come in because generally the rogue elements are pl plants. Right. You know, what they used to call them red squads back in our day, right? But they're red squads, in it, which you, you know, that, that police can justify coming in and things like that. So, so these kinds of things where we're not cooperating by, by feeding into that system, and I think the first thing, though, the first thing to start talking with young people about, or anybody about, but with young people, <clears throat> is number one, is know who you are and trust yourself, right? And don't believe them. But think. See, it's not just enough to say don't believe, <laughs> right? Because they already don't believe, but that's okay not to believe. But, here, but think. Here's really think. Because sometimes, sometimes we, 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 uh, we believe we don't believe something, but we do. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh -huh. right? but the deal is, but I mean, see, but when we when we activate our intelligence to thinking and just know within our own heads and really thinking, that stuff does get sorted out. Is and there a way to teach someone who, to think? <laughs> yeah, I think about that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank everybody. For, you know, uh, to be around the circle and uh, the one example I can give you is, you know, I had a group of students in, in Concord, California, that were dressing all in black. So I took a picture of them and I showed it to them because they were all wearing hoodies. They were all dividing themselves from the rest of the school. And this is the group that was getting targeted to for, from the whole school, not only from the teachers but from their own peers. So I just turned around and I showed them the picture of themselves standing in the corner in all black. I got them to see that they were looking like if they were at a funeral. Mm. But it took me to take that picture. It took me not to turn my back on them. You know, um, why were they dressing in black? Because that's the end thing. Was their end thing? Yeah, that's what's up. You know, that's yeah. what's uh, in style. It's cool. Yeah. You know, that's what's cool. <laughs> but you got them to think about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and and a lot of times it's, that's that's what we we could afford. You know, this is the, the hoodie is the only thing that's gonna keep me warm, and that's the only thing I could uh, afford at the time. Um, for me, it's been really hard uh, to get the adults to really listen, because I think as as youngster uh, as person being young we already know what we need 
You know, we've been getting shot at, chased for a very long time. And, um, you know, I have these guys at the hall and at the jail. I mean, all we need is a tattoo removal program for them to get a job. And we can't find the funding, we can't help the necessary needs to get that accomplished. And I have four to five guys, you know, with jobs already waiting for them, but they won't get them because of the ta their tattoos. How much does it cost for one guy? Uh, I really don't know. I mean, for us, it's really... It's thinking, how do we take that? Because we could go and go to Dominican and get that removed. But how can we take it and, and make it our own? I don't want to go to Dominican. I want somebody that has been through the process to, to remove my tattoo. So it's not only the machine, but how do we get a center for ourselves? Because right. that same person that got his tattoo removed can also remove somebody else's. And he has a, a, a new job, too. We, so, we need to go further back. We need to get before the tattoo comes. We need to address that situation. So we have... We, uh, I, and, and the ways one, of the reasons, one of the reasons... You, you know, someone was saying you work with the youth in Jamal. Yeah. And you're successful. Why are you successful? Because we're on the street. No. Why are you successful when you're working with those, with those youth? Why? Because you're working with small numbers. How many are you working with? Four? Five? Uh, are you working with 35 at a time? I think more because I'm also on the street. I'm also mm. at home. I'm at my church. Right. You know, but, so, and, and it's not only the kids that I'm working with, it's also the people that don't have tattoos because they're the ones calling the shots, they're the ones that are voting for these laws that are getting these kids caught up in these in, in these long sentences. So it's really, it's not, it's not, it's not only the kids that I work with, it's all around. And it's educating it's the adults too, what that tattoo removal program is going to do to that kid. And sometimes know. it's just moments of success. Yeah. It's not Definitely. like, because if it was that we were successful, then hey, boom, we move on. No, yeah. we get little things. Little like, victories. Yeah, yeah. Little ones. And, 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 and hopefully these are planting seeds that again mm -hmm. will, will, will blossom or will, or will see, be shared. I, mm -hmm. Well, what I was trying to get to is that if we can, we can start at the beginning and move people into small groups rather than these large mega groups that we put them in, they have a better chance of not having these problems. Well, well I look at it like this. When somebody has an illness, it's acute, and you have to deal with that. they got a fever. you got to break the fever. But there's a root cause of that problem. Mm -hmm. And if we don't deal with that root cause, it will, boom, come right back come up. Back. And it could come up worse or take them out. Mm -hmm. Root cause is they think there's something wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I think one of the things that we do, because we deal with generational uses of uh, heroin addiction, uh, we're known as the heroin capital of the country. And so you will have parents, grandparents, grandchildren, great-grandchildren in the same room using. And one of the things that we do at the camp, because it isn't an easy process, you know, uh, I think we're all trying to be creative and think about what will make it better or, or what will lessen um, the pain and the hurt um, that has been inflicted because it's all, all of that that comes with it. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, we uh, deal with our, our young people is that, first of all, they have to know that they're safe and they have to know that their environment is safe. And they have to feel comfortable with the people that are around them. And feel that, uh, uh, you know, that they're not going to be judged, hmm. um, which is really important. Um, and one of the things that we've done at the camp is that parents are encouraged to come and contribute uh, some hours to the, to the camp because they pay no money, nobody, to come. Um, but I don't encourage a lot of parents to come. And the reason is, is that, like I tell the parents, um, if the discipline has to come, it has to come from the collective, not from the parent. Here. Okay. And I think that much of what happens is that when you don't entrust young people to have the ability to make those decisions, to be able to implement those decisions, 
you know, because of our adultism and our knowledge, <laughs> knowing, and you know, it was like I was saying that's, earlier. That's a good newism. <laughs> you know, that one of the things is is that our knowledge is only to help, not to say it's the solution. The only thing we want to do is to keep you, in some ways, from making the same mistake, but not take it away from you, because that's your process. We can't take that process away, but what we can do is share what we do have. And I think that's uh, important, and listen to young people when they say, we want a tattoo place, but we want it to come and be somewhere where it's safe and people feel safe to be able to go there and say, this person's going to remove this tattoo in a good way, without being judgmental of why it got there or how it got there right. or, or things like that. So I think there's um, there's an important uh, a part that we need to, to go to and, and asking ourselves those questions, and I think uh, you tapped on them, and that is part of the human element of, of who we are. Because I think when we don't trust and we don't know ourselves, then we project those onto others. Uh -huh. And so I try to keep the adults from coming to the camp so that they do not project um, their isms of all the mm -hmm. isms onto um, young people. So I think that getting back to what you're talking about is that we have to go way back to that part of who we are as human and to be able to think we and allow. We have to get back to the being part of human. Yes. Yeah. That's what we have to do. Well, the, the adults, i say this as advisedly as I can, the adults think that they have to compete with the kids for my wife's attention. So what happened was the kids, you know, needed the time to be safe, and the adults were coming in there going, hey, I thought you were going to work on our problems. <laughs> and so actually, you know, when our mentor told us, you know, you might have to, you might have to, uh, you might have to go through losing all the adults just so you can, you know, be able to be there with the kids. The thing that got me immediately interested in what Felipe was saying, though, is there's so many impediments whether it's tattoo removal for somebody to get a job. You know, so when you're talking about body deployment, just to be able to do collective labor, I mean, even just to have people working together. I mean, imagine if you could clean the forest so these things wouldn't burn down to the ground. Now, that's a bigger question, but it's a smaller groups of people. You know, four, I mean, if I had four or five guys you know, in our forest to help me. You know, so they go through this process of healing and being safe and then being able to think and then if they can get their tattoo removed, they might be able to get a job. And if I had four or five guys in the forest, you know, I'd be a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, that remind, the other thing I wanted to say was, uh, does that mean, like, if, if you like other people, does that mean you like yourself? <laughs> Not necessarily. Right. <laughs> but, but, it, it, I, I, but liking ourselves is really something that... It takes a lot of work. <laughs> well, I, well, I like myself, and I'm lazy. <laughs> I like myself. But but the deal, but uh, but somehow that. But I say is it's in, in talking with young people. I mean anybody, but if we're, but there's a focus on young people. This is what I'm saying is this is about getting reaching some kind of understanding that there's nothing wrong with them, yeah. and not to confuse some of their behaviors. All right, that 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 there is something wrong with them. That it is okay to like themselves. Uh, and, and but I think it's something that kind of gets communicated, you know. And in a lot of ways, I think things that we have to say to young people, it's all in how it's said. If we say it in a way that makes sense, all right. <laughs> if we speak to them in a way that will make sense to them, all right. Some of them will get it, and some of them won't. 
But this is just, I mean, this is the math of reality, right? But you say it, to, you just keep saying what makes sense to them, all right? Looking for the ones that do get it. Because the ones that get it, then they'll make sense to somebody else. I mean, we're dealing with that basic of a math, mathematical equation. But, but I think that it spreads more quickly than we tend to give it credit for. Yes. And you're right. I mean, because a lot of these kids, they either use hip-hop now, poetry, tagging, graffiti art. And it, it, it is. It's One person is going to get one thing, but that person is going to project it out to That's the right. rest of them in their way. And they're going to get it. It's been working since, uh, I mean, hip-hop for me has, has educated me where reading and writing did it. Yeah. And I've been able to educate myself about politics through the music, through the art. So it's having these kids to realize that they have that gift, no matter what it is. I right. Think, I think one of the things that has made a difference is really understanding that when I had, when I found that gift to just stick with it, because many times, you know, I DJ. And my dad, the first thing my dad told me was, what are you going to do with that? How are you going to make a living with that? And it wasn't until years later that I traveled and I did make a living off of that. He realized, wow, he made a mistake by telling me that. Mm -hmm. So how do we how do we support those kids that do have that art? Because they could probably talk to that kid that I couldn't. <clears throat> well, it's getting getting past five thirty. Um, we have food. So we can continue the discussion. But um, just one thing I, I wanted to say that. I think what I value and what John's saying is that we don't know how change is going to happen. Um, if we knew, um, it would have already have happened. But if you, if you take step by step, you think we know how change is going to happen. There's forces that are going to block that. So um, we don't know how it's going to happen. So that's why we have to think and be creative and be open to anything. But we don't know where it's going to come from. But when I, when I got involved with the Grange, I, who would ever have thought the Grange would be a, become a progressive act center <laughs> for community activities? That's, well, it's become a community. Yeah, so, I, mean, it, I mean, its history in the last at least 50, 60 years has been pretty reactionary. Well, it didn't start off. Then. Yeah. yeah, I mean, a hundred years ago, it was very, it was very progressive. It, was progressive. And it, became, it became a very conservative, white-only organization. Yeah, I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, so, so I mean, just being open to anything, whether it's hip hop or, or the grains. I mean, we don't know where change is going to come from. We have to be thinking and creative and be open to. It. And I, one, one thing I would add to that about creative, I think about explaining to young people. With anybody, but we're folk, but if we're speaking in terms of young, is that understanding that the creative mind is always active, all right? And it's how the creative mind is being used. If we're using the creative mind to create negative images of us because we've been told we're not good enough, all right? See, so no one, so guys, a lot of them will say, "Well, I don't, I'm not create." We'll hear that. Well, I'm not a creative person. I'm not a thing. But the deal is. <laughs> we all are. We create our own reality every day on how we how we were imprinted to perceive reality. So if 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 a lot of time is devoted, the creative intelligence is put into thinking I'm not any good or I'm not good enough or this or that. See, so I think it's an, it's important to to explore that, start exploring that dialogue with them about our everybody is creative. It's just how do we create and what do we create. Yes. Well, a quick one. It can happen really fast any time. <clears throat> I was looking for a CD player at uh, Abbott's Thrift, and there were two little kids down on the floor near the electronics uh, section. And uh, I was just standing there like this. You know, I've been looking in the shelves here, and they were looking at a scuba mask. One little kid was about six, and his brother was four. And his little brother says, what's that for? And the older one said, that's so you can be safe. And I went, I'm either going to puke or say something. And I said, hey, you know what that's for? And he looked up and said, no, what's that for? And I said, that is so you can breathe underwater. And I walked off. I was like, 
six foot honky. <laughs> but what I heard behind me was the little kid said, What is it for? And the older one said, It's so you can breathe underwater. <laughs> I was like, Made my day. <laughs> Oh, also, um, John's got a few CDs, and this is what he talks about on here is a lot about what he's been talking about today. So they're ten bucks. So it's worth getting. Let's get it. Oh. Well, I, uh, so I made as much sense as I could. All right. <laughs> if whatever I said did, and whatever I said didn't make sense, keep it to yourself because <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> if it didn't make sense, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> We live up to it. Mm -hmm. I was, um, you know, we don't get much of these kind of discussions back home. Um, you know, we live in, uh, in the Santa Fe world. <laughs> we call it Santa Fe. And uh, our part of the world has changed a lot. And so, um, and we don't... Uh, a lot of people come to our, our property. Our home. Um, as a matter of fact, I have some people that are there from Canada right now, waiting for me to get home. <laughs> um, but this has been, you know, this has been really nice to be able to sit here and talk with people that have been involved in, in the movement for a long time. You know, because you don't get that. And, uh, and you don't see these discussions a lot anymore. I, I remember in the 70s and early 80s that we would have these discussions and people would think <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> and um, and it was nice. So this has been, you know, this has really been nice. It's been really nice and really nice to share uh, uh, with you and, um, and to hear. I've always heard your music. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and I say, all right. <laughs> you know, so it's uh, it's nice. I, I have Thank you. I had a thought, John, on uh, you know electromagnetic theory. And I used to study this guy named Tesla. Oh, Tesla was the man. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I thought maybe you were. Yeah. So yeah. when. Uh, you know when you get a re yeah. Come on. you know when the earth, when the earth and the brain get in resonance because funnily enough the ionosphere cavity resonates at 7.5 hertz which is also alpha frequency in the brain because the ionosphere cavity it's called the Schumann resonance so a guy named Schumann you know back in the 50s figured this out and so there becomes a you know, they, they call it the brainwave entrainment to the Earth's ionosphere's waveguide. Yes. And so what I'm thinking, of course, is when you get your clear and, and present thinking, you know, in phase, there's a phenomenon called the exponential. And so when two waves get resonant, the free electrons that are in the ambient atmosphere <laughs> I'm kind of using some old yeah, right. Tesla language. They start stacking into the resonance, and it starts to take off exponentially. So let's uh, let's hope as we can do this that uh, we start to see some of those effects. But everything's about everything's about frequency. Mm -hmm. Right. We do, so we tune we we tune our own frequency because what we're being electrically jammed with all the electronics. They're altering right. the frequencies. That's right. Yep. I mean. I mean, it's actually like, yeah, well, they're harnessing the energy. That's the first thing I studied, actually, when I got to Congressman Pete McCloskey's office in uh, 1977 in D.C., was he had me on the fact that the BART Bay Area Rapid Transit System was like an electrified cable in the ground, and it was interfering with the magnetic fields of nature and the surrounding area. So one of the Stanford scientists had put a magnetometer on a tree, to see what would happen to the tree's receptivity to the extra low frequency mm -hmm. waves that it was receiving from space. Mm -hmm. 
oak trees, of course. It's just so uh, let's go druid with that. Right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Well, when does it take off? What does that mean? Like, when they exponentially pile up and they take off, what does take off mean? Oh, no, I was just saying. What well, does that mean? What happens? Well, you mean when the wave exponentially increases? Just a minute. Yeah, and you I'm just said about that. The ions and the electrons. Well, the, well the, the free electrons start stacking onto stacking. the base wave, yeah. and so it increases the... And then what? Then you get more alpha? Or you yeah, you, well, you would... Well... <coughs> I guess it depends. <laughs> I guess it depends on the frequency. Okay. Okay. But you could get a multi-wave effect. It just depends what you've got in there. Okay. But yeah. That's why I mean, we were able to communicate along this. That's right. Yeah. Right. With, before they interfered. Yeah. Before the interference. That's right. If the well, web kind of shows us what we can do when the web goes down. We could do all that right without the web. Right? Well, we did it without. Yeah. You know, I mean, the we web is just an artificial system exactly. of what we already did. And we'll do it hopefully before they started telling us you need to use the web, the text, and everything. <laughs> to think. <laughs> no. Okay. 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 Thank you all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. Oh, now? Yeah, now. <laughs> <laughs> now. Now or never. She's so cute. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.